So now Johannes Weiner will present about SenPy automatic memory sizing for containers, a tool to um, find out the correct C group memory limitations. Yeah, so let's give him All a hand. Right. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Johannes. Uh, I work on the uh, Facebook kernel team. Um, mostly on memory management and uh, C groups. And uh, usually in the kernel space, uh, Senpai is a user space tool, although it's fairly low level, so um, that's something I've been working on. Um, so this is a tool to um, automatically configure um, the memory limits and uh, protection and stuff for uh, C groups and workloads that are running in C groups. And um, uh, the reason, the background for this is that uh, it's a fairly simple premise. Uh, we have uh, large data centers and RAM is really expensive. And so we want to uh, pack our workloads, all the stuff that's running in the Facebook fleet, um, as tightly as possible to uh, maximize our resources. And um, if we uh, over-provision them, we're wasting them, obviously. If we're under-provisioning them, um, we get uh, stability problems or issues during peak loads. Um, so, yeah, the main thing is we want to pack as tightly as possible, and for, in order to do that, we have to know exactly how much memory, how much resources a uh, workload needs before we fire it up. And um, we have a lot of workloads, so that's kind of hard to do, um, um, just, uh, just to cover it manually, but uh, even if you wanted to do it manually, um, one problem is that it's actually really hard for uh, for people to estimate the size of their um, memory requirements. So um, we have a lot of people that write, um, that write uh, high-level applications, and if you ask them how much memory do you need to execute this, they don't really know. But even for somebody who works um, on the lower part of the stack, um, it's actually quite tricky to estimate the exact uh, memory requirements of a workload. I'm going to show this uh, in an example. Um, so here is a, um, a simple uh, kernel compile job because I'm a kernel developer. Um, um, I put it into a C group, um, not for control, just for accounting, um, just for tracking what it allocates. Um, and then I let it run. And while it runs, I'm just sampling the, um, uh, the memory.current file of the C group, which just gives you the, um, the total memory consumption, everything that's allocated to that C group. And so after four minutes, it's done. And if you, um, if you look at the peak consumption um, in our lock file, it shows around 800 megabytes. Right? That includes everything, compiler, the source tree, everything. The job runs at the end, the peak consumption is 800 megabytes. Now, I have a suspicion that this is not exactly um, the amount of memory that I do need. So I'll let it run again. I set a limit of 600 megabytes first and I let it run again, and it takes the exact same amount of time, right? So um, the workload would allocate out 800 megabytes. It clearly doesn't need it. So um, uh, what's going on there? And in order to understand, um, you have to look at the, um, uh, the memory access distribution of a workload. Um, if you look at the graph on the bottom, I think it should be readable. Um, there is a uh, unique data that an, a workload accesses during its lifetime. And then on the y-axis, you see um, the access frequency. And it, not everything that is being allocated is used uh, at the same frequency. So if you look to the left where the access frequency is high, um, the, um, the compile job, that will be things like GCC, glibc, all the stuff that runs on every single source file, right? So it's pretty hot. Every, every, um, every instruction basically is touching that memory to execute the next line. Um, and then as you move to the right, um, you get things like, um, for example, make the startup. Or if you, if in, in the case of the kernel, the configuration system, it gets, it gets parsed first um, when you start the make job. And then once it figures out which source files it needs to, um, it needs to compile, it doesn't, it doesn't touch that memory anymore. Um, and then, of course, after the, uh, the source files themselves, you, as the compiler walks through the tree, it, 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 it builds one C file into an object file. It never looks back. Right? So, and what happened with, um, when I set the limit to 600 megabytes, um, 
all I did, instead of, instead of when the compiler moves on to the, to the next source file, instead of allocating more memory to cache it, it just goes like, okay, I, I'm hitting the 600 megabyte limit, I gotta reclaim something, and I'll just reclaim the memory that was holding the previous source file that's not being used anymore. Right, so um, even while reducing the memory, um, it can just basically timeshare a smaller amount of memory and just use it sequentially. And so when you see that, um, uh, obviously the question is, how much can you reduce and how much can you do this with multiple workloads? Um, like how far can you, can you reduce the limit before you hit that knee and you're gonna hit memory that's uh, really frequently used? So I uh, can run it again. Uh, set it to 400 megs this time, and it's still kind of completing in the same amount of time. Um, and then the question is, how far can we go? At 300 megabytes, I eventually aborted the job because it didn't look like it was going to finish, and it was uh, pretty I.O. bound uh, the whole time. So after 10 minutes, I like, okay, this is not going to finish. Um, yeah, so um, takeaway from this is, um, it needs somewhere between 300 and 400 to just complete normally, um, which is a lot less than the 800 megabytes that we initially thought. Um, and obviously, th this is some this is a data this is a piece of data we would like to have um, for basically all Facebook jobs. Because if we look at this, the question is how much memory are we actually wasting, right? Um, so the tricky bit is to do something like this at scale. Um, one problem is that a trial and error process like this is really tedious um, if you do it at scale. Um, um, but the other problem is you can't really do this um, with, with a constantly changing uh, software uh, implementation and also variable user activity, right? So the kernel job, it's the same files it's compiling every single time. I can run it as many times as I want. It's the same input over and over and I can just like modify it at one parameter and see what it does. But if we have a, a, a long-running service like a web server at Facebook that is completely driven by user activity, it's actually really hard to, um, um, it's really, I mean, you can't, you can't do trial and error there. Um, so uh, this is where uh, Senpai comes in. Um, and the basic idea uh, behind Senpai is um, you, um, you create artificial memory pressure on a workload and then you monitor the memory health as it's running to identify where you are on that graph that I showed earlier. Are you pretty much to the right? Are you just cutting off memory that is rarely used or not really reused or are you, are you cutting into that, um, that hot set on the left? And um, now the question is how do you, how do you, um, um, how do you identify uh, memory health of, of millions of different applications? Um, and so this is based on something I was talking about uh, last year. Uh, this is a kernel feature called PSI, um, which is um, uh, their uh, pressure metrics. And, and the way they work is um, they, record when, they record the time that a process that is trying to run is having to wait on the way of some operation, um, waiting for resources that are congested. So for example, if you, um, if you have a cold start of an application that's never run before, um, you're, you'll encounter a bunch of page falls, right? Um, but those page falls, you would have, they would happen whether you have infinite memory or not, right? It's just never been accessed, it's never been cached. But if you wait on a page fault for something that was very recently kicked out of the cache, uh, it's called a refault, and that, something like that would not happen um, if you had infinite amounts of memory. So when a, when a task enters a, a page fault and we can identify this was recently only evicted from the cache, we can record the time it takes for you to get that page back um, and, and, and record it as a, as a stall event. We can say this is time that only is being um, spent in the process because there's not enough resources. And so by doing this, we can, um, we can basically uh, profile uh, productivity of any given task in the system. We can go like this is spending X percent of its time waiting for resources or it's running really fast and it's fine. And the reason we originally developed this was to um, um, choose this root cause uh, regressions. We would have, we have machines where many things change during the day. Um, different parts of, of the entire software stack get updated. And, um, 
and sometimes things run slower, and it's actually really hard to say why they're running slower. Um, and there are some indications, you can look at the page fault rate, things like that, but you're not exactly sure what the exact root cause is. And so PSI was kind of developed to go like, you're waiting for I.O., you're waiting for memory. For example, if the, if the memory access pattern changed, um, you're now waiting for memory. And you can tell exactly, you're waiting 10%, you're waiting 20% of your total runtime. Um, so yeah, the regression uh, ident quickly identified this is where the time is going was, uh, was one reason. And the other thing was um, um, to fix problems um, with um, uh, over, total overcommit um, uh, to, and to automatically remedy those. And this is something that, for example, UMD does um, when, um, when memory pressure gets too high and we're spending like double digits percent of the entire time uh, just waiting on memory. Then we go like, okay, this is extreme, just kill the workload. Um, no, this is good at the, at the high end of pressure, but at the very low end, um, PSI is actually fairly sensitive. So it, it can record events that take uh, like microseconds. And um, this is where uh, Senpai, um, this is where Senpai um, uh, makes use of it. Because um, once we have something like PSI in place, what we can do is we can we just modify the um, the, um, the C group uh, memory allowance continuously, and then in a feedback loop monitor the PSI pressure. And this is how we can tell um, when we're approaching that knee when we see an um, uh, um, when pressure kicks up, and uh, and then we can back off instantly. We know okay, this is this is the line. Um, and the idea is we apply enough pressure to, for, for, uh, for PSI and the Senpai to detect, but within the tolerance of the workload before, before latencies go up too far uh, or throughput drops. And um, so this is the uh, same kernel job run with uh, Senpai. And you can see the, um, the time is still around four minutes. Um, I set it kind of aggressively, so there's a couple extra seconds. But for most batch workloads, you would probably wouldn't care. Um, and as you can see with uh, recording the memory current, um, it takes about 340, 335 megabytes of, of memory. And obviously, that's not, um, the memory consumption is not like a single value. Um, in the graph, you can see um, the blue line is the memory current lock file of completely unconstrained um, kernel builds. Um, and you can see at the very beginning, it, 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 it seems to read a bunch of uh, data into the cache that it just never ends up using again. And then with the red line, you see Senpai putting pressure on it, and it's cutting away a whole bunch of that memory um, that is seemingly not needed for the entire duration of the workload. And um, so uh, we put this on, um, on some web servers in Facebook. And uh, the blue line, the value doesn't really matter all that much. It's mostly indicating the requests per seconds coming into uh, to those machines on average. And um, as you can see um, with the yellow line um, indicating the uh, memory consumption of the web server software, um, it, it drops from uh, uh, 15 gigabytes to uh, below 10. Um, and the, the requests per seconds are unaffected. So the load balancer doesn't see that the machines are struggling to handle a request. It just keeps giving them the same amount of work. Um, but also interesting, it's not just the, uh, the memory uh, reduction the, or the seeming, re seeming reduction in what we think it's using, but you can also see that um, when you look at the yellow line to the left, it's kind of noisy. And when you look to the right where Senpai kicks in, it, the memory footprint um, follows the, uh, the load that the machine is experiencing. So it's not just a reduction, it's also giving much more accuracy. Um, and um, um, that's something that, um, uh, that's a, uh, another project we've been working on. The, uh, Dan Schatzberg, who was talking about resource control um, uh, yesterday, was also uh, working on this. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of uh, widely deployed um, um, uh, binaries that run on every single machine in Facebook. And um, because they're relatively small compared to the host size, they, what, what their, exact, their exact footprint can vary and it doesn't affect the workload all that much, but obviously for uh, development reasons, they want to know if they regress, if, if they suddenly need more memory than before. 
And uh, so they were interesting, uh, interested in, in using SendPy to give, uh, get an exact measure on how much are they actually consuming, how much are they actually taking out of the resource pool. And um, uh, we had uh, one binary that, is, uh, that, that runs periodically to collect um, a bunch of statistics and puts them into nice graphs, uh, locks, locks memory consumption, locks CPU utilization, all of that. And um, what they were using was a, um, they were looking at the, um, the RSS size of the main process to, to estimate how are we doing memory-wise, are we regressing, are we using more or less. And um, th their own estimate was about that they're using 200 megabytes. And um, we, we put all of this into a C group and put SendPy on it, and, um, and it showed that their actual footprint was like seven times larger. I think it was like one and a half gigabytes or so. And because it was, it was all that memory they were missing, um, they, they were uh, touching f uh, files on the file system, so they're, not, they're, they're, they're allocating cache on the uh, file system cache that they're not including in that RSS-based estimation. Uh, they're forking off collectors, um, they're using network. Um, all of that memory is being tracked by C groups, but they weren't tracking this. Uh, this. And um, uh, yeah, so um, um, so the current state of Senpai is it's, it's more or less a um, well, it's kind of a proof of concept that's growing into a production um, uh, piece of software, and. Um, um, so right now there's um, there's a, a Python implementation, and uh, Dan's been working on a uh, UMD plugin to make it much easier to deploy. Um, and uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, plans that are more or less um, uh, long, medium to long term. Um, one one part is the uh, the sampling between um, between PSI sampling and making adjustments is following a fairly short window right now. And um, the idea is to uh, be able to learn from longer-term trends. So if um, if there's a if there's a bad pressure event um, that indicates oh we're way too low on memory right now, it shouldn't it shouldn't forget about it in like two three sampling uh, periods down the line and just recall and have like long-term trend tracking that it doesn't do. Um, then also um, compressed RAM instead of having to go to secondary storage. Um, if um, if you're running too low on memory, because it would allow us to be um, um, uh, more aggressive with uh, tuning the memory limit, because if if we tune the memory limit too aggressively right now, it means we have to go to disk before we detect the error. And once you go to disk, the the minimum amount of time that you're waiting is is uh, like secondary secondary storage I/O, which is uh, pretty. Um, pretty costly. So we have to converge fairly um, slowly and move slowly. And with compressed, compressed backing storage, we could, we could aggressively shrink memory. And if it goes wrong, it, it wouldn't be that costly, but still detectable. Um, then there's a bunch of stuff on the kernel side that we could do um, PSI annotations. For example, if you're causing memory pressure that's causing more paging, that is taking out of the IO bandwidth. So unrelated IOs that are not memory related could also be slowed down. Um, that's also something that's not currently being tracked, which it doesn't, right now the way we're using it is completely fine because we're, we're applying pressure at a scale where the IO impact is very low, almost, I mean, it's negligible, but it would allow us to be more, all these things would allow us to move more aggressively and converge on the actual memory consumption faster. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, this is the, um, uh, this is the GitHub repo for um, uh, for where the uh, current Python implementation sits. Uh, if you want to go check it out, and uh, yeah, this is it. Questions. Um, is it dependent on Tupperware, or is it looking directly at uh, C groups, and does it use C groups v1 or v2? Oh, it's uh, oh, thanks. That's a good question. Um, so I try to keep the dependencies very low, especially on the uh, Python thing, the Python implementation. It's um, it's directly working on the C group two interface, and uh, the reason it's C group two is because um, there's no PSI in C group one, and um, um, another feature that it's using in the Cgroup interface is something called memory.hi, which is a, um, a memory limit that only throttles but doesn't umkill, 
right? Because we would never want the Senpai to cause kills. We want it to be um, an undetected observer as much as possible. And so um, we only use memory.hi, which exists in C group two. And other than that is Python standard library. There's not really, yeah. <laughs> Comment. All right, I'll just quick question. Um, how does it basically like how tight does the loop have to be for it to apply memory pressure on processes that are only running for microseconds? Uh, oh, so the, um, the current sampling period is um, um, the default anyway is uh, six seconds. So um, it 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 reads it reads pressure and monitors every second but it doesn't do adjustments more than every six seconds because when you take away memory, it's completely dependent on the workload when it will notice, right? You can take something away, it might be accessing the cache like a minute later and it's like, no, you don't know. So it, it, um, um, right now it, it defaults to six seconds, which, seem to, uh, which seems to work um, pretty well in practice. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that could be sped up with, um, um, if we have compressed RAM as a backing uh, or as a secondary storage, um, where you can just move more aggressively, and if we make mistakes, it's more forgiving. Yeah, so kind of a related question. Can you describe the refaulting behavior? Um, and the, the related part is that if we're looking at something every six seconds, or whatever the period is, um, like if the process was restarting every seven seconds, perhaps. Um, would that mean that all the... Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Chef. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've forgotten my question now. No, I refaulting. <laughs> refaulting. Yes, so um, the, um, the refaulting mechanism is to, it's the, the kernel remembers when it's kicking out entries from the cache, and then when they come back, then uh, we, can, we can, first we can detect them this, w this has been kicked out very recently and somebody's reading it back immediately. So we can tell there's an event that means the cache is kind of thrashing. And then uh, PSI can measure how long it takes and um, we, can, we can then uh, conclude like this is taking time out of the, out of the productivity of the task. So regardless of the process. Independent of the process. Yes, so um, the, ref the refall technically is a, a process independent thing. It's, it's kind of a, um, a thing that the cache is um, experiencing, but we can, we can detect when individual tasks are waiting for a specific cache entry to come back. So you can have one refault and you can have multiple tasks at the same time waiting for that thing and experiencing their own memory pressure. Um, what was the second part of your question? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so that's it, thanks a lot.